how do we measure adulthood? Is it uh, the ability to tell right from wrong? Is it the ability to make judgments? Is it knowledge? It probably should be a combination of these things, but having lived my whole life around adults, I'm not convinced. <laughs> we measure adulthood in years. I'm going to give you a couple examples today of why we sorely need to rethink how we assess adulthood. A bit about myself. I'm an eldest sibling. My two brothers and I were born and raised in San Francisco. Here's a picture of us looking rather dashy. <laughs> I'm also a design intern at Khan Academy, which is a phenomenal nonprofit organization that has created uh, an internet based learning platform that's used by more than 10 million students every month. Uh, about a year ago, I dumped the summer camp gig. Uh, I know I want to study architecture, and although I've learned a lot from B college programs over the years, I have no idea what the architecture workplace is like, and I was hungry to experience teamwork, to contribute to a project, to have professional responsibility, to be an adult, essentially. So, I put together a resume, I acquired a glowing letter of recommendation, and I applied to architecture firms in San Francisco, New York, London, Copenhagen, and in a sort of international phenomenon, I got the same answer from everyone. We're not interested in hiring a high school student with no previous work experience. And I thought, what am I trying to do now? <laughs> Around this time, as I was crumbling my last letter of rejection, and things were looking like a dead end. I found out that Khan Academy was about to launch a new project that necessitated the design of a physical space. And I thought, this could be a great opportunity to immerse myself in a professional environment to be part of a team. So I proposed them a summer design internship in which I would design, or at least help them design this space. I got a response from a man named Jason Pittman. Call it what you will, he took a chance or he didn't think I could do any harm. He hired me. <laughs> and although I did go on to design this space, it wasn't a slam dunk. I didn't immediately assume the responsibilities of a professional architect. Although I only found out about this later, there was a trial of assessment and evaluation. About a week into my internship, Jason thought, maybe we don't need to hire an architect got everything we need. And Al has been very independent and very responsible, and we all have keys to the office, so we should have a key to the office too. So I got a key to the office. So what was this project? Khan Academy is intended to be a companion to students who are not getting enough or who need help with their day-to-day -day school activity. Uh, but Khan Academy has grown to become more than a companion. It's a content resource. And they're dedicated to innovating in education. They took this a step further by an experiment in which they are trying to craft the full package of education. So the Khan Lab School, this uh, is a school for five to 11 year olds. There are about 30 kids enrolled. It's in Mountain View. It's a real place. It looks like this. This is uh, an empty warehouse that Google owns before Khan Academy leased it. This is one of the proposals that I produced while on the lab school team, and this is what the school looks like now, okay. two wow. months after being opened in September of 2014. But before I tell you more about the lab school, let's talk a little bit about traditional education. Everyone has an issue with how we teach kids. I have a really specific complaint. There's a conviction that young people, especially children, can't have a negative experience with a subject or a whole topic. Because if they do, then they'll reject it forever. So I, I have two criticisms of this emotional safety net that is in place everywhere. Firstly, it's wrong. It's uh, actually the polar opposite of the mindset that's most productive when it comes to teaching students. Like Mark Wong alluded to in his talk, we should think of schools as video games, because often frustration can be the greatest motivator. The trick is helping a student fall in love with what they're going to learn before they learn it, because that way, when they do encounter frustration, rather than rejecting what they're doing, 
they're going to persist. Much as in, in video games, frustration can actually be the greatest motivator because often something being so hard is what makes you most want to figure it out. My second criticism is that much in the way a 10-year-old child who has spent their whole life living indoors will get sick as soon as they leave the house for the first time. A student who has had their hand held their whole life throughout their education will not know what to do when they encounter a genuine obstacle later in life. So we're doing more harm than good with this emotional safety net. So we need to get rid of that. Um, let me tell you a story about my younger brother, Nicholas. He's a middle schooler. He's a theater buff. Here he is playing Creon, King of Thieves. He doesn't love math, but one day after school, I was walking home with him, and I had learned something particularly beautiful in math class pertaining to calculus. And I wanted to share it with the next person I saw. So I asked him, Nico, do you want to hear about this really great thing I learned in school? And he said, yeah, sure, why not? So I started by telling him that we had learned this really interesting application that you can use calculus for. And he stopped me and said, well, hold on, like, what's calculus? So I said, okay, well, calculus is this tool we can use to figure things out about function. And he says, back up, what is a function? So as elegantly as I could, I explained to him what a function was, and I pointed out the significance of the things that you can figure out using calculus. In about 20 minutes, he had grasped the fundamental concept of one of the most elitist topics in high school. I didn't teach him how to do anything, but I helped him fall in love with the notion and when he went home that day, he started scribbling on a piece of paper trying to reconcile everything that I had showed him. Essentially trying to derive a fundamental principle of calculus. You can imagine he couldn't do it. But rather than giving up, he came to me and said, Ale, will you teach me how to do this? And you know you're doing something right when a student comes to you asking for you to elaborate, not because you weren't clear the first time, but because they want to know more. And a student who has been protected from the nuances and the complexities of content in school will never come ask them. Let's talk about the lab school. The fundamental principle that guides the educators of the lab school is that young people are capable of taking on significantly more responsibility than we generally expect. This is reflected in their daily structure. The second half of every day at the lab school is reserved for studio work in which students work independently or collaboratively on a project on which they're given almost to total autonomy, guided by an overarching theme, which changes on a monthly basis. And you can walk around the school and say, Ale, these projects look like arts and crafts. What are these students learning, spending half of their day, every day, working on projects, and no one is telling them what to do? Well, yes, this is a piece of art, but it's also data. Every one of these stars is a math problem that student was able to overcome in the past month. And every drip is a math problem that student was unable to overcome. That theme of the month was, who am I? And students were encouraged to take data, data about themselves over the past month. And they were given independence in summarizing it at the end of the month. So while one student might choose to express the data they collected about themselves in a poster, other students might code video games inspired by their daily routine. Every student at the lab school is learning to code, not because it's Khan Academy or because it's Silicon Valley, but because they're smart enough. And because when it comes to facing frustration, learning to program is actually one of the most rewarding topics when it comes to learning persistence and patience. This extends out of the classroom as well. We're afraid to let students get hurt, but ultimately, more scratches, more bruises, or grow better makers. That day, students were building gravity parts using adult tools. And what could we expect these students to make if the tools they were given were as diluted as the content that students traditionally get in school? Probably not anything interesting. And if you let them take the driver's seat, students want to be in control. This guy, he's got a shirt that says, this isn't even my final form, which I think is amazing. <laughs> there he is. Um, and they ended up having a fantastic time. 
So, what's the point here? Should every student use buzz socks and be given complete control over their curriculum? And should every high school student take on professional responsibility? No, that's not the point. I was incredibly lucky to have a project like this in my backyard. Not everyone is. The point is that young people have the freedom to take on as much independence as they're comfortable with. I learned with this experience, with this internship, and looking for a job beforehand, that it's very difficult to convince employers to take you seriously. And the issue is that it's actually a genuine fear. Because students who grow up having this emotional safety net support them throughout their whole educational career will not know what to do when they encounter genuine obstacles later in life. So an employer knows that when a high schooler wants to join their team, it's most likely that this will be the first time they have to learn a lesson about frustration. And no employer wants to be a student's first. I urge educators not to support their students by trying to protect them from content that might scare them away, but rather by helping them fall in love with everything they're going to learn so that very early on they understand that frustration, besides being an inherent part of everything we pursue in life, can actually be one of the things that motivates you the most to achieve your goals. And employers, I urge you to change or rethink the way that you assess adulthood. Assess, like Jason did for me, someone's adulthood based on their maturity, or their enthusiasm, or their independence. <laughs> And you, ask yourself, how much can you really learn about a person just by counting how many times they've gone around the sun? <laughs>